title of my video is that speaker measurements are mostly bullshit. And uh, that's my opinion. And it's based on several things that I'll get into. Uh, but first, I want to talk briefly about what I mean. Uh, lately, well, I can't say lately, because as long as speakers have been built, they've been measured. But uh, certainly a growing trend over the past few years is to measure speakers independently. And I'm not talking do-it-yourself ones uh, in particular. I'm talking about retail ones you can buy. Uh, measure them independently with sophisticated, expensive equipment, and then give an overall rating based on what those measurements say. And um, one of the criteria is flatness of response, frequency response, and also off-axis response, how even that is. And I'm not going to say that those are bad things. It's just that, like I said in my last video, um, where I talked about learning electronics, nothing is as simple as it seems. The, you, you can't, like, you can't derive simple answers for complex systems, you know, it just can't be done. There are, are lots of different factors involved that will determine how good something actually is. When it's a, a purely 100% subjective thing. Because when you think about it, the music that you're listening to, like there's no place where you can go and listen to the music as it was recorded when it was recorded. There's no, there's no like um, thing locked away in a vault that is the, you know, the example of what that sounds like. Every time that music gets played, it's going to sound slightly different because there are so many different factors involved. Now, I know that a good measure for speaker performance would be flat frequency response, as in something to shoot for. And certainly if you're going to build speakers, um, your own speakers, that would be something to aim for. But at the end of the day, whatever, however flat they are, when you take those speakers and put them in your room, then that all goes out the window. What you're looking at is the frequency response of the ELAC bookshelf speakers that I used to, you know, while I was setting up my listening room downstairs, I took a bunch of measurements in a bunch of different locations. And these speakers measure really flat. But when you put them in a room, they're anything but flat. The room ruins that. Now, you could make an argument that, okay, if they're not flat to start with and they're all over the place, then putting them in a room makes that even worse. But is that actually true? My experience in particular over the last year in my listening room where I've tried several different um, configurations for my active speakers, that's one of the beauties of DSP. You can set them up in a certain way and listen to them for a week or a month, or even a year, or more, or forever, as far as that goes. And you can also change it to another configuration where they're going to sound different. And what I noticed when I did this, because I've done it several times, you know, you, you're listening and you're saying, well, there's something slightly off here, maybe I could tweak it. And so you go and you make a new configuration. And to your ears, it sounds like maybe something's changed, maybe something's better. But then you listen to that for a week and it sounds great, but if you happen to switch back to the configuration you started with, it's going to sound different again. It might actually sound better than what you were just listening to. The fact is you get used to how things sound. When your speakers are playing in your room, you're going to get used to it. And that's probably one of the things that drive audiophiles to experiment with different things, you know, buying different amplifiers and different cables and different turntables and all this stuff because eventually whatever they're listening to they get used to it and it starts to sound i can't say dull but it sounds wanting maybe is the best word to use 
So they think that they can improve it by substituting something else. And they put something else in there and you can hear a subtle change. And any change at this point seems like an improvement. Now going back to what I said about this being a complex system, there are actually a few complex systems, primarily three, when you're listening to music and that are involved. The first is the speaker, how it was designed, what it was designed to sound like, the components used and how they, you know, how much bass they put out, how much mid-range they put out, how much treble they put out. If the frequency response is perfectly flat, like I said, you put that in your room, which is the next <laughs> complex system that changes. Also, there is the ultimate complex system of your ears connected to your brain and how you'll interpret that sound. I can speak from my own experience that every time, almost every time I go to my listening room and listen to music, it sounds like the experience is different. Some nights it sounds so good. And I, I like the last thing I want to do is leave. And other nights I just, it, it just, like it, it won't come, you know, it's everything I play sounds terrible and I cut it short. So when I watch a video on speaker measurements and the person is talking about, you know, a two decibel dip here and a three decibel boost there. And uh, there's a little bit of a peak up around here. That's maybe five decibels and shaking his head saying this is bad. Like I'm shaking my head saying, wow, like that's absolutely not true. You're going to take that speaker and put it in a room. It's going to sound a certain way to a certain person. And that's all there is to it. Now, I'm not discounting the importance of speaker measurements, but I think that it's a, a realm that's really, that really should be limited to speaker builders in that they aim for flat, even response if that's what their goal is. Because I've listened to configurations in my listening room that were anything like would measure anything but flat and they sounded really good. And then I said, I listened to the flat and that sounded good. Okay. But like I said, you get used to whatever you're listening to. All right. So that's the long and the short of that. What else have I got going on? Well, I've been continuing work on my 10 channel amplifier. I've got all of the amplifier boards assembled and this particular one here, well, all of them actually are wired up now. I'm just in the process of testing and measuring each one before I install it in the app. That's very important. You want to make sure. Okay. I was very careful putting these things together, but mistakes happen. So test and measure, make sure that nothing is awry. And so far, everything is checked out. I've actually got five of the amplifiers put in. Like I've got half of the amplifier assembled already. Well, the half, the amplification half, you could say. And then the other five going the other side the same way. And then with that done, I can move on to uh, building the crossovers. But first, I've got some work to do down in my listening room with what I talked about before, setting up a configuration to hard code these crossovers to that I'm going to be happy with in the long run. Like I said, over the last year, I've been experimenting with different configurations to try to pin down something that I'm most pleased with. And kind of compounding the issue is that I could change the computer down there from one that had digital output to one that doesn't. And I'm currently using a sound card as the output analog out to the DSP rather than digital out. And so that has made a difference in how it sounds as well. So I've got quite a bit of work down there to figure that out because I don't want to like the crossover boards are capable of fourth order all the way through. But I don't want to do that if it doesn't sound right. Now, my current configuration downstairs is actually 
for the four-way speakers is a six, um, six decibel, a first order filter on the lower part of the woofer at around 70 hertz. And then a, I think it's 12 or it might be 24, either one on the upper part of the range at 300 hertz. And then the next one is the mid woofer. And I think that is a 24 and a 12 and the 12 crosses to the mid-range, which I think is another 12, and then a 24, and then this is 24 to the tweeter. And of course, you don't have a low pass on the tweeter, you just have the high pass. So yeah, I gotta make sure that what I'm, what I settle on, I'm happy with. And so that gives me lots of time <laughs> to assemble the um, crossovers because there are certain ones there that I know I can do. Mid-range to tweeter, for, for instance, I know that that is not going to change. It's just the lower ones that I really need to play with and try a few different things.